Hello, welcome to Emotional Badass, where Moxie meets Mindful. I'm Nikki Eisenhower, your host, life coach and psychotherapist. And on today's episode, I'm discussing grieving and goodbye 2020. Hello, y'all. I want to give a quick review of simple grief. Most of us know the five stages, denial, anger, depression, bargaining, and acceptance. I'm going to give you a quick rundown and reminder of what each stage is. And one of the struggles with grief is that we don't move through each stage in a way that checks the box. We don't move from one stage. We don't complete it and then go to the next. That would be very orderly and very contained and controlled if we could do grief that way. But grief is, it's just not the nature of the beast. We don't have control over it in that sort of measured, concrete way. So we move through these stages and we move back through these stages. We dance through all these stages a bit before finally getting to acceptance. Denial is typically named as the first one. Now, denial is not what people tend to think of it. Denial is not being on your second bottle of wine in the day and someone saying, I believe you may be an alcoholic and just saying, no, that's ridiculous. I'm not an alcoholic while you slur. That may be our sort of movie definition or our consciousness from the movies or from TV about what denial is. Denial is not just a willful dismissal of what's obvious. Denial is a strategy of our brains. Denial is there so that when we have a big, massive loss, like when I lost my grandmother, denial helped shield me from integrating how huge that loss was for my life. So denial is a buffer of sorts. It's like if you serve me a birthday cake, I can't eat the whole thing at once. I'll choke. I'll get sick. My stomach will hurt. That's why that first slice of cake tastes pretty good, maybe even a second. And by the third, or if we're really pushing it, the fourth, we feel gross. We're like, oh, this doesn't taste good anymore. We have mechanisms so that we don't take on too much in this natural body. And grief is no different. So denial helps us bite off what we can chew grief-wise. And that might be hard to consider because even with the element of denial, we may feel so heavy or weighted down or gobsmacked by a loss that we may not sort of feel, oh, thank you, denial, for buffering that for me. But we are buffered. So over time and as we move through grief, layers of denial drop off until we can integrate the fullness of a loss. So denial might be a pacing agent. It's another way to think of it. Anger. I mean, who of us is not familiar with anger, right? We all know anger. Why would we get angry as part of grief? Well, because we have no control over what we're losing most of the time. Or if we did have some control, we may feel that we've screwed it up or lost something or life's chaos just overtook. And we may be mad at that, enraged. In grief, we can feel powerless. I'm sure many of us can identify with having felt certain elements of powerlessness this year. Anger's also another protective layer over the vulnerability of a loss. As human animals, psychologically, we would rather be angry than in vulnerability. Anger is powerful. That's why if anyone's ever seen a dog hit by a car, that dog looks angry. It's snarling. It's growling. That's not just because it's hurting and it's not just an expression of pain. That's so that instinctually in the wild, if an animal is injured, they're telling the other animals, don't come near me. I still have fight in me. It's self-protective because they know they're wounded. They know they're not at their strongest. And so they get angry. In grief, we may in some ways 
do a similar thing. But with our human consciousness, we're angry when we are powerless, not just when we're physically hurt. Because we want to be powerful agents as human beings in our own existence. Anger and grief really shows us where we don't have control. We've seen that a lot this year in the political realm. That when people can't control what other people think or what other people do, anger comes out. It's a powerful emotion. But when we peel back that layer, that protective layer of anger that makes us feel so powerful and protected, we can peek underneath and see what's more vulnerable underneath. And for a lot of us this year, it's been fear, powerlessness. If we've lost work, it might be financial insecurity. If I go back to my example of the dog hit by the car being in pain and fear, I'm sure that that dog doesn't spend energy thinking, blaming, or shaming the driver of that car. Our consciousness, our big brains, our intelligence. Maybe one of the unfortunate consequences is that when we're hurt or that we're scared, we don't know how to just be like that dog in the pain of it. So we go to our mind and we create shaming and blaming stories. We put energy into how dare that person drive like that. Why did he hit me by the car? It's a difference we have between ourselves and an animal like a dog. When you're seeing highly sensitive people make a lot of jokes that they might not think of as jokes, that dogs are better than people or pets are better than people, this may be part of what we mean. And one of the potential lessons within our grief and our pain of this year may be in how to be more present with what's uncomfortable for ourselves and have some boundaries with our human ego that wants to shift out of being with that pain to blaming because we feel more powerful if we're blaming and angry and lashing out. But learning how to be and move through and release will help us move through not just our anger, but our entire grieving process more swiftly. And when we're not blinded by anger or we're not in rage or we're not terrified, we know that very well. That makes sense to us. It's only when these emotions that are highly charged surge through us that we struggle to know or believe that it's okay to be and move through our pain So as we move into this next year, there may be an opportunity to integrate a lesson. You'll have to choose your lessons. One of the lessons I'm taking is that I want to be able to practice very intentionally sitting with my pain and resisting the ego's urge to blame. The next stage is depression. And this is where it really hits us. This is where we really feel the kick in our heart and in our guts. Maybe like we are out of breath. If you've ever fallen on the ground and lost your breath. When our defenses are falling away and we're feeling depressed. Think about what the word means. Not the clinical definition of mental health depression. But depressed. We feel pressed down. The tongue depressor that an ear, nose, and throat doctor uses to look at the back of your throat. It presses down the tongue. Depression, in a sense, is anger turned inward. It's feeling heavy, pressed down, weighted. One of the unfortunate things about depression and grief, I believe because we don't teach emotional concepts in our country, is that we don't have to be as depressed as we are angry. We don't have to be as depressed or angry in an amount that's equal to our love or to our passion or to our wanting. Sometimes we can inadvertently, dysfunctionally believe that if we love someone very much and lost them, we should be exceptionally depressed and that there would be something wrong with not feeling like we're in a dark hole, that that would somehow betray the person that we love. And oh, that is so backwards, y'all. So if you are feeling a depression because of this year, if you are feeling a depression because you've lost your job, you've lost financial momentum, you've lost career momentum, 
or maybe you are one of the people who has lost people due to COVID or due to any other thing, accidents, cancer, and heart attacks, anything else that you might be grieving, we can consider, do our loved ones want us to be depressed because we loved them and they're gone? I can't possibly buy into that. And if they do, I can't believe that that's their healthy part. I can't believe that that's their own hurt part. That's their own regressed part or their own part that learned that that was right when it doesn't have to be. A way that I honor the people that I've lost along my journey to death or otherwise is that I want to live really well. I want to celebrate each day. Now, we can't do both. If we are in the process of depression, we can't spiritually subvert our process. And what we don't want to do is sit and go, oh, I understand these stages. I'm going to understand them in my head and I'm going to bypass them. We can't get heady and bypass our pain. We can't think our way through and spiritually bypass feeling. So if you are in the depression, I encourage you to write about it, to speak out loud, to talk to anyone out loud as if they're there next to you, to process through your pain and move through. Depression gremlins are extremely seductive. We need to be mindful about not feeding those gremlins and letting those gremlins get so big that they're harder to fight off. The stage that has the most confusion for people is bargaining. And bargaining is just that stage where we plead, where we beg our higher powers, where we beg the universe. These are the deals that we make with our own versions of God. Whenever we've seen anyone in any movie say, God, please just let this person pull through this surgery or this accident or this ordeal and I'll never drink again. That is a bargaining. And this is just us as human beings emotionally stepping into, maybe I can make some deals. How about this? How about this? Can I make any kind of deal with my higher power to get what I want? One more conversation with my loved one. As we make peace with those questions, as we internalize, well, I guess I can have those conversations, but not in the way that I want, not with my grandmother fully embodied and alive sitting across from me, ready to give me an open-armed hug. It's not available to me anymore. As we move through our grief process, we internalize some of these realities The acceptance stage, when we start to let go of the questioning because we're getting closer to acceptance, to integrating the loss into our being, to finding a new reality, a new truth, a new way of being, of interacting, of surviving life and being on the planet. When we are there, we are in acceptance. And in acceptance, the truth is we don't get to choose the lessons But as we get closer to acceptance through our grief process, we have chosen the wisdom that we will take forward. And that will make the next grief, it won't make it easy, but it'll let us move through it with more confidence that we can move through, that the pain won't drag us down and drown us. Acceptance is also a letting go of the fight. When we're in bargaining, we're still fighting the forces of the universe. We're fighting what is and what we don't like and what we didn't sign up for. And so much exhaustion sits there for us as highly sensitive people within that fight, fighting things that we just can't control. Or maybe unfairly giving ourselves hell, expecting ourselves to control what we don't have power over. Acceptance is a letting go of all of that. Acceptance is a holding on to the good parts of what we've learned, of what we want to carry forward from the people or the experiences that we've lost. And it's an honoring of life and moving forward. Some of the greatest grief lessons in my life that didn't happen to me were in the gift of being able to witness and help walk people through when they were widowed very young. And I resist using the word widow because I know that people who have been widowed do not like that word. 
And if that's a news flash to you, it's because that word is sort of like the scarlet letter in a similar way to when I say to someone, yes, I have no contact with my mother and they struggle to process how that's possible. When people hear the word widow, they tend to shut down. They don't know what to do with a person and it can make a person feel alien on top of their grief. Witnessing the strength in people choosing to go on to honor life after losing their great loves, it taught me in a way that I couldn't really read in a book that people can suffer tremendous loss and still continue forward. We are resilient creatures even when we're mad at that. And part of the struggle of this year has been that we have been unable to grieve in the ways that we are used to being able to gather and grieve. Chris, my fiance, producer of the show, he lost his grandmother this year. She was in Brooklyn. We didn't come together as a family this year. And I know we're not alone in that, that that has happened all over the country and all over the world. We are tasked with moving ourselves through these stages without some of the comforts of our gatherings, of our traditions. And we're still tasked with not getting stuck in any one stage. And yes, this is easier said than done, but we are all tasked with moving through anyway. What I can offer you to end this year is to make a list of what you're grieving, big and small. Kids, y'all have lost the structure, the security of going to school, of not even having to think about whether school would be there or not, just having it as a consistent being available to you. Even when you fought against going, it was consistent. It was reliable. It was there. And for kids who have very dysfunctional families, that's a real tragedy because school was a breath of fresh air. It was a safe space. People have lost jobs this year. They've lost career momentum. I feel a sense of loss as little as this is And as much as all my basic needs are met, and I know some of you listening are struggling to meet basic needs, but this is important for all of us to be able to acknowledge to ourselves all the little things that we've lost too. I've lost the restaurants in my neighborhood. I live by Trader Joe's as small and inconsequential as it seems. There's always a line about 10, 15, 20 long outside because they're not letting them in the store. So I've even lost that little human thing and being able to just run in the store and grab one thing and run out. Each errand like that takes more thought, takes more planning, takes more effort. It's been a tiring year. As an exercise, to just list, what have I lost? Maybe it's alone time. Maybe it's quiet time. Moms, maybe you've lost some sanity trying to become homeschooling teachers. We might feel an inner resistance to sitting down and looking at what we've lost. Each year, for over a decade now, for New Year's, I do a little ritual. I have two candles. I simply light one, and I turn, and I go through my year, January, February, March, April, and I just think, what did I go through? What came to fruition? What didn't? This year, I'm going to sit and make my grief list big and small. The hugs I've missed, the smiles I've missed because people have been in masks. And I'm going to look those things right in the face as part of my own grief work. And when I've looked at all of it, I'm going to take a deep breath and say goodbye to it. And I'm going to blow out one of those lit candles that was lit for this past year and say goodbye and close the chapter. And then I turn my body 180 degrees and I look forward and I light the second candle. That candle is for hope. That candle is for honoring the gratitude of the things that I've learned about myself, about the world. It's a permission to hope. It's a permission to plan. It's a permission to look forward. And this strange particular year, My candle ceremony is going to also be a permission to flow, to flow with the things that I am powerless over and to step into the empowerment where I can choose, 
No matter how this year has been for you, I hope you can take a moment with me right now to take a deep breath and to realize how strong you are to still be here and that we can let go of the pain in 2020 and move forward into empowerment for 2021. doesn't mean struggles are going to go away, but it means we can own our mindset and the energy that we're bringing for ourselves and for each other. I want to thank all of you who have supported us this year, supported us by listening, supported us by buying meditations from our store or buying a sweatshirt or a mug, supported us at patreon.com backslash emotional badass where our community is growing, where the content we have there for you over 30 episodes now has been growing. We're going to hit our third anniversary for the show in spring. This was the hardest year for me to do this show. If you've been lis- if you've been a long-term listener of the show, you know that I am a big believer that the only way through is through. And I hope you can celebrate yourself that you've made it through. And I will see you in 2021 with light, love, growth. We have a lot of new offerings for you, so if you're not on my mailing list, come find us. Get on one or both of my mailing lists so you can stay up to what I'll be offering that's, that's really new and exciting for 2021. I'll be able to make some announcements next year. Light and love. I'm sending a big, empathic HSP hug out to all of you as we grieve and we say goodbye to 2020. I'm an emotional badass. You're an emotional badass. And together we are where Moxie meets Mindful light and love. Bye.